All right, hello, welcome to another Biomin webinar. Today we are uh, involved in sustainable nutrition and health in Mediterranean aquaculture on this on today's topic. It's specifically we're going to dial in to sustainable fish feeds for healthier fish, food, and seas. In order to explore this topic, we're going to talk to a couple of experts from outside of Biomin. Uh, first, we're joined by Esther Santigoza, senior scientist at DSM. Hello, Esther. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Very glad you can be joining us. Um, why don't you introduce yourself a bit to the audience, for those of you, us who may not be familiar sure. with your background. Sure. I am Esther. I am responsible for aqua innovation in DSM nutritional products based in France. And I'm responsible for the support of vermice application in aqua species in the beginning of the project. Excellent. Thank you for that. We're also joined today uh, by Pete Verstraat, who's going to be joining us from a little bit further away. All right. Um, Pete is founder and CEO of 4C Consulting. Hello, Pete. Hello, Ryan. Happy to be here with, uh, with all of you. So my name is Pete Verstraat. I'm the managing director of 4C Consulting. Our company's mission is to improve profitability and sustainability of companies active in aquaculture and in pet food industry. For this, we provide a wide range of services from feed formulation to feed meal construction. And we are active in the Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, India and the Indian Ocean. And we basically work on all aquatic species and the different culture stages. Very happy to be joining you again. Excellent. So thank you, Esther and Pete, for that introduction. Um, for our audience, I just wanted to point out that today we're live. This is an interactive session. So at any point, if you have a question for Pete or for Esther, uh, go ahead and use the chat function here in the platform to type that in. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can after the prepared remarks towards the end of the hour during our dedicated question and answer time. It also means that we're going to be able to ask you, our audience, a couple of questions throughout the session. So look for those opportunities to share your opinions on this topic as well. Now, as you've heard, uh, we are dialed into the Mediterranean in particular. Uh, it's an area that covers 22 different countries, right? And we have a diverse audience uh, represented from the aquaculture industry, from aquafeed, from research uh, integrations as well. Very glad to have you all on board and joining us for the discussion. You've already heard the sustainability is a key topic that uh, here in, in today's session, but also um, main focuses of both companies as well that our experts represent. So let's go ahead and get started. Pete is going to uh, introduce us to this topic and the role of nutrition. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Baimin, for inviting me for this webinar to pre uh, present on sustainable fish feeds for Mediterranean aquaculture. Let's set the scene and start with, um, oh no, I have it again, Man, what did I, sorry. Sorry again. Okay, you see me? You see the slideshow? Yep. Okay. yep, we have the list of countries there and the production numbers, absolutely. Okay. Sorry again, some technical issues. So let's set, set the scene and have a look at total production numbers. So the countries bordering the Mediterranean uh, Sea are producing a total of 2.23 million tons of fish, with Egypt leading the dance with a phenomenal production of 1.5 million tons. The other countries producing about 775,000 tons, with Turkey almost 30%, uh, sorry, so almost half of it, and then Greece, Spain, Italy, and France. Species-wise, there's a big difference between the northern Mediterranean countries with a predominant production of carnivorous species, sea bass, sea bream, and trout, representing about one-third each. And then Egypt, where carnivorous species represent only 5% of the total fish production, with a predominant production of tilapia, carps, and mullet. With respect to sustainable fish feed, this makes a big difference, as the carnivorous species need nutrient-dense diets and have an absolute and optimal requirement for hufa, and thus will be more dependent on fish meal and on oils in their diet. Whereas the omnivorous species, such as tilapia, 
can grow on fish meal free diets and only require HUFA for optimal performance, health and fish quality. Now to develop sustainable fish feeds, first of all we have to achieve optimal performance under the prevailing culture conditions and only secondly, secondly we will integrate our sustainable ingredients, complements and nutrients into our diets. Feed formulation has a crucial role in this as it makes the bridge between optimal animal performance and the sustainable sourcing of ingredients in order to maintain this performance in the future. Now sustainability really starts with animal performance. So we have to optimize performance and feeds all along the whole production cycle by focusing on broodstock selection, juvenile health, grow out efficiency and adapted finishing strategies. Impressive gains in growth can be obtained by genetic selection of fish. In salmon, a 270% increase in growth rate was achieved by selection from 1975 till 2010. In tilapia, a 350% increase was achieved in 25 years time. And I believe in the last decades, still major advances were made. We can target different outcomes from the genetic selection process. We can select for optimal performance, growth, survival, for disease resistance, for instance, against tilapia lake virus, or for performance with more sustainable diets, as in this nice study done on rainbow trout, where the rainbow trout was selected to, for their ability to grow on a diet without fish meal and fish oil. It shows that the relation between genetic selection and nutrition is very intimate. The nutrition of the breeders will have an impact on the selection process itself and the genetic selection has an impact on the optimal nutrition of the offspring. With genetic selection for faster growth, the requirement for nutrients in the diet is increasing. For example, in shrimp, they find a higher methionine requirement with shrimp selected for high growth. It is likely that this is also the case for several nutrients in fish. The next crucial step in the production cycle is the juvenile stage. The importance of adapted nutrition for juveniles is often overlooked. I've seen companies using the same formulation for a 2 mm diet as for a 6 mm diet. But we have to consider that the juveniles are transferred from the comfort of the hatchery into the hostile environment of the sea cages and ponds. At this stage, the young animals undergo several stressors, transfer stress, nutritional adaptation, environmental stress, and challenges by pathogens. It is also at this stage that the fish are vaccinated, so a very crucial step. So therefore, a very palatable, highly digestible juvenile diet, including functional nutrients such as vitamin C, vitamin E, DHA and EPA, and some osmoregulators, is vital to obtain optimal performance. The raw material choice of your juvenile diet should be in between the hatchery feed and the grow-out feed to allow for gradual adaptation of the digestive system and the associated microflora. One of the major problems for all species cultured in the Mediterranean are the relatively large temperature fluctuations, and especially the low water temperatures in the ponds or cages during winter. Several stressors occur at the same time and affect performance and can cause serious mortalities. The effect on the animal is threefold. The immune system is suppressed, the digestive enzymatic capacity becomes limited and mem membrane fluidity is reduced causing osmotic stress. On top of that, with changing temperatures, opportunistic bacteria develop ready to infect the already vulnerable fish. So adapted feed addressing each stressor can alleviate this stress and assure that the fish are more resistant. Trials with adapted functional feeds have successfully been done in marine fish and tilapia to address this issue. The fourth step in our production cycle is the finishing stage before harvest. This step has gained importance as the consumer becomes more demanding on the quality, nutritional value and healthy aspects of the fish that he or she is eating. In this finishing stage, we will correct fish appearance, such as color, and the impact of fish meal and fish oil reduction on the whole body and fillet composition. Typically, the ratio of digestible protein to digestible energy is increased to get leaner fish. Pigments are added into diets of several species. 
Vitamin C and E and organic zinc are supplemented to improve fish and fillet quality. An addition of UFA in the finishing stages to modulate the fatty acid profile before marketing is getting increased, increased attention. And surely my colleague Esther will elaborate on this point in her presentation. Finally, in the production cycle, I would like to stress the importance of technology to optimize performance. The use of sensors, underwater cameras, and automatic feeding systems help us tremendously to optimize growth and FCRs. But a major tool for continuous imp uh, performance improvement are the new, or let's say recently developed, integrated management systems developed to record and analyze performance all along the production cycle and assure full traceability. The use of such software is an absolute must for optimizing fish feeds towards more sustainable formulation as only with this it provides the link between diet formulation and performance analysis and improvement. I believe it's time for a poll question, Ryan, so I go back to you. Absolutely, so thank you for that, Pete. Um, let's go to our first audience poll question. We're, we're going to put a question up on screen and uh, give you the opportunity to choose an answer. Uh, where are you on this journey in terms of exploring uh, sustainable ingredients? Do you use new marine ingredient alternatives, um, Ms. Peters mentioned, uh, besides vegetable protein and animal byproducts in your diet formulation? Please go ahead and choose the one best answer that fits your current situation, either if you use them in your own operation or if you're in a consulting role and if you advise uh, the use of these um, new marine alt ingredient alternatives. The answer choices are yes, I'm currently using alternatives. Yes, I plan to use alternatives in the near future. No, or not sure. And let's have a look. As those answers come in, we're going to go ahead and share those results with you here once everyone gets a chance to vote. And we're going to make that a part of our discussion. Now, I've seen that most of the votes have come in. We're going to give you just another moment or two to go ahead and make a selection if you'd like to participate and then we're going to close the poll. So thank you for everyone who has now voted. We have about half of our live audience having shared their response. Let me put that up on screen for you. And let's have a look what you said. All right, now, in terms of using new marine ingredient alternatives, we have nearly half. So 48% say, yes, I'm currently using alternatives. 14% say, yes, I plan to use them in the near future. 29% say no, and 10% are not sure. Um, Pete, is there anything that jumps out at you there in terms of the results? Is, was this characteristic of what you'd expect in the Mediterranean? Uh, I think I think yes, because um, I think in the last uh, last years people have been uh, working actively on this, and I think progress has been made, especially on some uh, some of these ingredients which I will discuss, like the marine by byproducts and uh, these kind of more sustainable alternatives have been integrated in the in the diets. And I think um, progressively we will we will work more on that, and we will go through the different alternatives that we can use, and it will be done, I think, more and more in the Mediterranean. I think it's a satisfying answer. Excellent. All right. So why don't you tell us a bit more about these new alternative ingredients? Sure. I hope. Okay. Let's go to the second part and we, we look at once we have optimized our full cycle performance with adapted diets, we need to look at our ingredient choice and integrate sustainable raw materials into our diets to become performing and at the same time more sustainable. Now, of course, to improve our choice of ingredients, the first thing to do is to look at our, let's say, traditional ingredients. For the production of our carnivorous species, we are still consuming about 380,000 tons of marine meals and 100,000 tons of fish oil in the, in the Mediterranean area. And looking at the origins, we can see considerable differences between different areas. If we look, for instance, at Greece, is sourcing primarily from Denmark, Spain, Germany, and Morocco, and some South African product, whereas Turkey is depending largely for the major share on Moroccan meal and from meals from Black Sea and Mauritania. The important point in all this is to move entirely towards sustainable sourcing and favor marine meals from certified origins like I4RS or MSC certified. But not only looking at our marine meals is important, we should also scrutinize the other raw materials that we are using. 
sustainability of our plant crops such as soya with respect to land and water usage should be verified and certified too and I think on this point we still have a long way to go. Of course finally and that's the topic of our discussions today also to support sustainable growth of aquaculture products we have to be less dependent on our fish meal and fish oil. So let's have a look at why fish meal and fish oil is so important for our aqua feeds. The basic composition is of course important to us. Looking at the protein, fish meal is a very rich source of essential amino acids with protein levels going up to 72% and more. But more importantly, that amino acid profile of the fish meal is very close to the ideal protein for fish. The ratios between the various essential amino acids is crucial in feed formulation and fish meal simply represents the most balanced source of the different essential amino acids. Also, the soluble protein fraction is important for our diet's digestibility, attractivity, and palatability. And of course, looking at the lipid fraction, the fish meal and fish oil provides it with the essential fatty acids, so, so much required for marine fish. And also, fish meal and fish oil is a good source of cholesterol and phospholipids. Phospholipids is an emulsifier, which is underestimated for its importance in high-performance aquafeeds. Well-processed meal, finally, is also very digestible to our aquatic species, and the combination of this high digestible protein and the high digestible energy supplied by the fish meal is often indispensable to formulate our energy-dense diets, such as feeds for marine fish and salmonids. But as we start to understand the composition of fish meal and fish oil quite well, and we are able to replace most of the nutrients, the question remains why we are so successful in replacing fish meal and fish oil in lab scale trials and often we lose the performance in field trials. So several components present in fish meal may not seem essential for growth but do affect the performance and health state of our, of our fish. EPA and DHA have an effect on fish health and membrane fluidity. Some nutrients play a role in liver protection and osmoregulation. Phospholipids are crucial in lipid digestion and fish and fish solubles are a very rich source of nucleotides and free amino acids, having an impact on attractivity, feed intake, and, and possibly health. But it's not only the components that are in the fish meal which making our job more difficult. When we replace fish meal and fish oil, it's not only too important to consider what we take out, but we also have to manage the possible negative effects from the alternatives used. Because if we introduce raw materials that are further removed from our ideal protein, we can cause amino acid imbalances. Many plant protein sources contain antinutritional factors and phytic acid, and high ash animal meals and high fiber raw materials, plant raw materials, sorry, can affect digestibility and polluting the culture environment and providing organic matter for potential pathogens to thrive. Oxidated oils and fat and mycotoxins affect the immune system and can cause inflammation. All these negative factors may not kill your animals immediately, but the full cycle effect on performance is not negligible. For example, it was very interesting the study done on livestock that the growth reduction due to gut inflammation was calculated up to, to have an effect of to 30% reduction. Sorry. Uh, the growth reduction due to gut inflammation was found to be up to 30% in livestock, which is a tremendous loss of growth due, due to inflammation. Now, we don't have these precise numbers of the cost of inflammation in the different aquatic species, but we do have quite some information on the direct impact of mycotoxins. I believe Ben will discuss this topic in detail in his webinar, so I will not go in too much into detail on this. But another important factor I would like to discuss. We must remember that we are not only feeding the fish, but also the gut microflora. So reduction in fish meal and fish oil also creates a shift in the microbial communities and may alter the gut structure, which in turn has an impact on the immune system. Studies done on sea bass and sea brim give us indications on, on these changes in the microbiota and gut structure and the resulting impact on fish health. So basically, fish meal and fish oil replacement is not only about compensating and balancing all essential nutrients taken out, but also managing the potential negative impacts of the alternatives used.
The next step in our quest for sustainable aquafeeds is to look at new sustainable ingredients and feed complements. In a nice article on the future of aquatic protein, the most uh, promising sustainable protein sources were identified as the marine byproducts and insect meals. Other product potential sources still have constraints on production feasibility or do not have the required protein content, which makes them suitable as feed complements rather than protein sources. In Mediterranean aquaculture, another group of ingredients is widely used, namely the land animal byproducts. We will go through the different alternatives and have some comments on each. So the marine byproducts are widely used, especially trimmings from several species, species such as tuna from Spain. Typically, these meals have lower protein contents and a higher ash content, which can affect the digestibility. The risk of contaminants such, such as heavy metals need to be carefully managed, especially when the meals are made with a high content of internal organs. Fish hydrolysates and fish solubles become increasingly popular, as they can be highly attractive, very digestible, and they help us to increase feed intake in plant-based diets. The salmon byproducts present considerable volumes already, and especially the use of salmon oil is very popular in Mediterranean aquaculture. Some products are very fresh and show very low oxidation values, but HUFA levels are generally on the low side with an EPA plus DHA level of 7. Squid meal is highly nutritious and is mainly used in specialty diets such as functional feeds, broodstock feeds, larval feeds and booster diets. And krill meal has additional functional properties such as pigmentation and osmoregulation and is commonly used in functional diets for salmonids. From the land animal products, the poultry meals and poultry meals and feather meals are very popular because of their price. However, uh, the fat quality and the protein digestibility of the keratin in the feathers are the main constraints for using them in higher inclusion levels. Various qualities are on the market from highly standardized feather-free product to products with varying composition. Hemoglobin Hemoglobin powders find their, start to find their way into the formulations due to their high protein content, excellent digestibility and possible health effects. However, for these products, blood meal and hemoglobin, the processing is key because it impacts the solubility of the product and thus the digestibility. In general, for all land animal products, byproducts, they should be checked for uh, antibiotic residues to avoid problems. From the new sustainable raw materials, the insect meals and algal complements show the biggest potential to become a major nutrient contributor in the future. The nutritional value of insect meal is very suitable for use in fish feeds, and we have, we have even tested it successfully in hatchery feeds for sea bream and shrimp. The main bottleneck till now are the volumes produced, but the info provided at F3 webinar on the subject some weeks ago indicate that in insect production will be scaling up in the coming years and more volumes will become available. Sustainable DHA and EPA sources from algae are now commercially available to the great joy of aquafeed formulators, as they are val valuable complements to correct the HUFA levels while reducing fish meal and fish oil in our diets, and also to boost the, le the HUFA levels in the fish and fish fillets for the consumer's health. I believe it's time for our second poll question, Ryan. Yes, thank you, Pete. Let's go straight to that. So you've outlined several alternatives. Let's ask our audience their views here. So please uh, go ahead and choose the answer that you uh, think is the most promising alternative to fish meal or fish oil uh, based on your opinions. Of course, we've got the insect meal as an option, algal meal, plant-based proteins, yeast products, or perhaps you're not quite sure you don't know uh, what the most promising alternative is, and that's part of the reason why you're here and you're joining us today for this discussion. Uh, we've got plenty of answers coming in now, uh, and we thank you for that. We're going to give everyone just one more moment uh, to weigh in if you'd like to participate. And now we have over half of our live audience having uh, submitted their opinions. Let's go ahead and see what you have to say. So. Your thoughts on this are the most promising alternatives to fish meal or fish oil at 43% in the lead, insect meal, 
um, followed by algal meal at 32%, plant-based proteins ranked at 14%. Um, no one chose yeast products, interestingly, and 11% were unsure. Uh, now, Pete, is it at this point, is it possible to say that there's one right answer or will time tell of ultimately whether the wisdom of the crowd prevails? <laughs> I think we will uh, we will always use a, a combination of, of uh, alternatives. So clearly, yes, insect meal is popular because of its, uh, let's say, gross composition, where it can be used uh, as a as a full raw material, protein source, fat source, energy source, and all the functionalities that it might might bring in the future. Whereas the algal components are very useful to complement uh, our 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 plant ingredients or our other ingredients, and to complement with the functionalities that it has. Uh, I'm sure Esther will elaborate on that, but okay, we, it's very crucial in our search for uh, making more, uh, uh, reducing fish meal and fish oil that we have the, the, the HUFA comp components from the algal complements. So it will be used together. And of course, we will always uh, use the plant, plant alternatives, whether in big inclusion levels or lower inclusion levels. So I think everything will be mixed together, but it's good to see that uh, people believe strongly in the insect meal, which is... Uh, Still, some some work to be done, but I think it would be a very good alternative for for us. All right, thank you for that perspective. Uh, so we why don't you continue on with your remarks, and then we will, uh, as you mentioned, get to Esther. Then. So we go to the last part of the presentation, because, however, when our traditional ingredients and our new alternatives will never be sufficient to provide us all with all the necessary nutrients and functional components that we need to optimize our, our culture cycle. The requirements from our animals are increasing while as the offer of nutrients is, uh, de let's say, limited or decreasing. So the gap between these nutrients derived from our raw materials and the optimal feed requirements is widening. And therefore, in our whole story of um, becoming more sustainable and decreasing our dependence on fish meal, fish oil. We have to use our additives and premixes uh, because it's becoming more and more important. And apart from the basic and vitamin, let's say the basic vitamin and mineral premixes, we will use, need to use different premixes for different functional, functional objectives. We will be using premixes for balancing the nutrients while we reduce the fish meal and the fish oil. I touched some of the nutrients that we will need, but a special importance has to be given to the palatability and attractants. And then we will use different solutions for quality corrections according to the problems. So we will use enzymes for digestibility and reduction of anti-nutritional factors, uh, toxin binders for mycotoxin contaminations, antioxidants for protecting the oils and fats, and liver and hepatopancreas protectors, etc. Also, we will need to adjust for our, our environmental factors. We can choose to add osmoregulators, uh, special min uh, minerals and components to, to improve the stress, stress resistance and the membrane fluidity. One important category, and I think uh, it will be addressed uh, in, a, in the next, in the last, uh, sorry, in the next webinar by Ben, is of course that for the health improvement, we will use our different tools coming going from simple vitamin boost over immune stimulants, pre and probiotics, and gut health improvers such as organic acids and essential oils. Of course, some other additives can always be added with specific objectives such as pigments in finishing feeds. So I propose to go through a practical example uh, on gilted seabream sea to have a look at, uh, let's say, a commercial example of formulating a more sustainable diet. The absolute levels are not so important, it's just to show how the concepts are applied in practice. So the objective of this, of this uh, trial, first trial in a series of trials, was to reduce the fish meal and fish oil in seabream, in seabream feed while keeping the good performance. This was crucial, we had to have equal good performance and fast growth and survival. So fish meal was reduced from 35 to 25, sorry, from 35 to 25 percent and replaced by a mix of plant protein and hemoglobin powder. Fish oil was reduced from 6 to 3% and replaced by vegetable oil. Now the first step in balancing or correcting our diet is to rebalance the amino acids. 
and to take care of the amount of soluble protein that we have in our diet. Secondly, we have to adjust the mineral levels and adjust for some reduced or potentially reduced mineral availability by adding, for example, organic minerals. Next step was to adjust the lipid quality. The pro, uh, lipid profile was correcting, corrected by adding a sustainable source of UFA and adjust the phospholipid levels. After we adjusted the levels of some functional nutrients involved in osmoregulation and liver protection. And finally, as a last step, we managed the potential negatives in the alternatives, binding mycotoxins, improving gut health by essential oils and organic acids. So bringing it all together in this presentation, we start with saying that sustainability starts with animal performance. And we looked at some key points to optimize the production cycle and the role of feeds and feed formulation, the interaction with genetic selection, juvenile quality, the culture environment, and fish meal, and sorry, and, and final fish quality, which has to be corrected. We stress the importance and the role of technology and performance analysis through dedicated software programs to improve on the sustainability and make the links with our feeds and our feed formulations. And in order to assure future performance, we have to formulate with our sustainable ingredients and complements, reducing the fish meal and fish oil in our diets and use our additive and premix toolbox to provide additional nutritional and health functionalities. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Ryan. Pete, I really appreciate you uh, providing that framework for us. Uh, certainly a lot of information there. And just a reminder to our audience as we uh, continue the discussion, uh, if you do have any questions, go ahead and enter them in the chat function, either now uh, or later during the question and answer session. We'll try to get to those uh, as many as we can now and, and follow up with you if we don't get to them today. Um, Esther, we're going to hand it over to you right now. So let's go ahead and get that presentation up. Uh, we'll do that just in just a moment. Absolutely. Can and you see here my we're going screen? To dig in. We do see your screen and we do see your slides up. Absolutely perfect. Please go perfect. ahead. Thank you very much. So um, I'm really happy to, to have the opportunity to share with you some of the latest results that we have obtained using this uh, omega-3 alternative vermarise oil uh, for the, the formulation of diets for Mediterranean species. I would like to start my presentation focusing not only in the animals but also thinking a little bit beyond that in talking about the human health because we know that um, all humans we are keen on eating fish and seafood in general because we know that it's a, a very rich source of healthy fatty acids, proteins, vitamins and minerals. Besides that, we know that a lot of studies have correlated high fish intake with better health outcomes in the human population. And I'm talking here about the decrease in the number of cardiovascular diseases also a decrease in the, the incidence of certain cancers and also some types of dementia. And at the same time, this high intake of uh, marine products also correlates positively with better infant health and better neuron, neuronal development. These studies um, correlate these better health outcomes with the high levels of EPA and DHA that we have in these marine products. And that's the reason why the health organization recommend a daily intake of EPA plus DHA of 250 milligrams. But unfortunately, that's not a reality. You can see here the omega-3 index on this uh, map. In the red uh, highlighted countries, this omega-3 index is really low and this is uh, correlates perfectly with higher incidence of cardiovascular diseases and dementia, as I was mentioning before. So our, our industry has really a key role to play to improve the health population, either by pushing for more fish intake in the humans, either by increasing the quality 
or the nutritional profile of these uh, fish products. And what why I'm mentioning this nutritional profile? You can see in, do, in these two, two charts, I have adapted them from some data of the University of Stirling. You can see in the left-hand side chart uh, the amount of EPA and DHA that we have in the fillet of the animals. And then we can convert this into the data that you have on the, on the other chart, on the right-hand side of the slide. And you see there the number of portions that we need to eat per week to be able to cover those health recommendations in terms of omega-3 fatty acids for human. And as you see here, only the wild mackerel, wild animals are in blue, uh, farm animals are in yellow. So only with that uh, mackerel, uh, we are covering the requirements. So for the rest of the farm the species, we need to have more than two serves per week. And unfortunately, this might be increasing the number of portions that we should recommend, because as Pete was mentioning, we know that we have a dynamic in the formulation of the diets. Briefly, because we all know the story, historically we were formulating our diets with fish meal and fish oil. Nowadays, we are in this kind of mixed situation when we are using the fish meal in combination with vegetable proteins and the fish oil in combination with different blends of vegetable oils. We know that the fish meal and especially the fish oil are the, have a high content of EPA and DHA, but the vegetable sources are deprived in those omega-3 fatty acids. And moreover, we know that that's not the end of the story. All the feed companies are exploring these new ingredients, aiming to formulate the new generation of aqua feed. And as Pete was mentioning, we are thinking about uh, formulating diets with very concentrated vegetable sources, single cell proteins, different types of insect meals. And all those alternatives are deprived of EPA and DHA. So to ensure the growth in a sustainable sustainable way of our industry, we need to make sure that we are complementing those diets with a source of EPA and DHA. And that will have a positive impact in the health of our animals. I will talk uh, about this uh, just uh, after now. And also we will improve the health of the human population. And the question, the main question that we I would ask here is whether we think that the consumers are aware of this importance of EPA and DHA for their health and for, for the planet. So I think that, Brian, you have organized a poll question here. Yes, let's go to that now. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we are going to go to our third and final uh, poll question for today's session, uh, continuing on this topic with the consumer side of things. Uh, what is it that they're willing to pay for? Uh, this answer is a little bit different because you can choose multiple answers, right? So select any and all that you uh, think apply in your opinion. What criteria are seafood consumers willing to pay? Is it responsibly farmed? Is it high omega-3 content? Is it sustainable, certified label, or perhaps not sure? Obviously, many of the votes are, are coming in. And it's interesting because this, um, as Pete mentioned earlier, you know, the finishing stage is becoming uh, more important um, relatively because consumers are more demanding than they've been in the past. So uh, knowing what it is they're willing to pay for is clearly important uh, for the industry. And with more than half of our audience, 60% of our audience having voted, we're going to go ahead and give you just one more moment. Participate if you'd like. And then we're going to go ahead and close the poll and let's have a look now with those results, thank you for your responses. Let's see what it is you had to say. So interestingly, uh, according to our live audience, uh, high omega-3 content uh, came out on top at 70%. Is it in, in their view, the top criteria seafood customers are willing to pay for, followed by responsibly farmed, nearly half, 47% of you. Then sustainable was 40%, certified label, 23%. Now, Esther, can you tell us how do those numbers bear out? Do you have anything, uh, that, any insights about what consumers really are willing to pay for? 
Exactly. That was a key question uh, when we were developing Veromise. And you can see here, I have pushed, put together some of the data that we obtained from US salmon consumers, but we have similar figures for the rest of the countries in the world. And that's really interesting to see how this really matches with the, the answer from, from the audience. So basically, yes, consistently consumers are interested and willing to pay more for products that are healthy for them. They are pretty convinced that this health benefits are related to omega-3 fatty acids. And again, they are caring about how those products are being produced. So they do want to preserve the environment and to a, a lower level, they are also um, interested in have some kind of real reliability. So some certification that, that pr provides them this certainty in how those products are being described. So I would like to talk a little bit about the fish because we, we are all agreeing that EPA and DHA are good for human health, but obviously those same molecules have important physiological benefits in the animals. I will go quickly through this uh, schema about the omega-3 and the omega-6 biosynthetic pathway. We all know that we have this uh, set of enzymes that are shared among uh, the two pathway six and three. And we also know that especially in marine species, those enzymes are don't regulated. So animals are really struggling on elongating and desaturating those uh, 18 carbon fatty acids that we can obtain from the vegetable sources to longer prefer. So that's why we are considering EPA and DHA as essential fatty acids because they need to be provided by the diet. And that's very important, not only because the, the functions of the molecules themselves, they are part of the, the cellular membranes, but we need to keep in mind that they will be transformed in other molecules that play key roles in the immunological responses. And schematically, you have EPA, DHA, and also arachidonic acid coming from this omega-6 uh, pathway that will be converted into different eicosanoid families. So we have prostaglandins, leukotrienes, resolvins, and marazine. And the importance in, in here is that they have, those different families have different uh, functionalities. So for example, the eicosanoids that will be produced from arachidonic acid have a more pro-inflammatory uh, characteristics that then can be counteracted by those coming from EPA, for example. So again, we need to find a right balance to have a good response beyond growth and survival uh, in the animals. I was mentioning that we are talking about essential fatty acids. This means that we know that below the requirements, we will be in deficiency con conditions. And that's illustrated in this gray zone the number itself will be dependent on the species and also the physiological uh, status or the stage of this species. But always, if we are in the, on deficiency, we will have very clear indicators, mainly a decrease in the growth and a decrease in the survival. Above that specific threshold, if we have ideal conditions, we will be uh, covering the needs of the animals. So we will have healthy animals growing well with no any, a, any challenges. But we all know that in more and more, we have some challenging conditions in the farms. We can think about, for example, a disease outbreak, handling a stress, thermal stress. And in this case, we know that when we are increasing the amount of EPA and DHA in the diets, we can have better outcomes in the production. And that's related to the fact, as I was mentioning before, we know those omega-3 fatty acids will be converted into different eucosanoids and will play a role in the immunology of the animals. There is uh, growing evidence for this need of an optimum omega nutrition. As I was saying, we are not talking about only growth and survival, 
we know that increasing the amount of EPA and DHA accordingly to the needs of the animals, we will also improve the immunity, we may have better reproduction outcomes and also a better quality of the final product. And I will not go into details for that. Uh, as Brian said, uh, information will be available after the webinar, but we know that balancing these three uh, fatty acids will have really nice outcomes in terms of reinforcing immune systems or better thermal or pathogen resistant. We know that those fatty acids play a role also in bone mineralization and bone healing, for example. So, so we need to keep that in mind when we are formulating our diet. Um, so basically, uh, with veromice, we can provide those alternative omega-3 sources to the animals that's a natural and simple source of PPA and DHA containing the both uh, EPA and DHA and also a small amount of arachidonic acid. It's a non-GMO product and it's free of contaminants. And I'm talking here about dioxins and PCBs and I will come back to that one later in the presentation. When we are thinking about the application of the product is a quite easy application. We do not need to modify the process. We have the flux flexibility in the formulation and we uh, can provide a stable and reliable supply. Just uh, the illustration on how Vermeer's algae oil on top of the, of the chart is comparing to different types of South American and North Atlantic fish oil. So basically, we have a really uh, rich and very and really nice balanced diet in the product in terms of omega-3 fatty acids. But again, that's the theory. So I wanted to take the last minutes of the presentation to show you some of the examples that we, we have used to prove the efficacy of this alternative in the diet of different fish species. I have combined different examples of trials that were done in an independent way using vermice oil and also some of our internal trials. Again, this information is available and I have included the references for further, uh, for further uh, consultation. So this first, first trial was done in the frame of the F3 challenge uh, using California yellow, yellow tail as a species. And you can see in the chart, three different diets were formulated without uh, fish meal. FMF stands for fish meal free diets. And those diets were combinated with either fish oil, vermice oil, or soybean oil. And you can see that when we are comparing the fish oil and the vermice diet, we go into the same equal performance. And we also got the similar uh, survival index among those treatments. Interestingly, we were able to increase the essential fatty acid content in the, in the final product. In a similar diet for a, a similar trial for Campachi, in this case also again you can access openly the formulas in the F3 uh, webpage. And again, you can they demonstrated that you can grow these carnivorous species on marine free diets without any impact in the performance or the survival. And interestingly, for these trials, consumers uh, voted or scored better the animals um, fed on marine free diet, suggesting that in some cases, avoiding or decreasing those fishy tastes is also an important point for the consumer. Here I have illustrated uh, one of the, the trials that we have uh, done in rainbow trout. In this case, we, we combine fish oil with vermaries or vermaries alone, and we go to a very different levels of EPA and DHA in the diet, going really uh, high in EPA and DHA inclusion. Again, always the same performance and the same survival, uh, very high digest digestibility of the different omega-3 fatty acids independent of the, of the source. And what was interesting here was that we were able to increase the fatty acid deposition in the fillet. So we know that roughly the fatty acid profile in the diet will always be reflected in the fillet, but there are always some question marks 
especially if we are including those expensive fatty acids and they are used for basic processes as for example getting energy being peroxidized. So in this case interestingly we saw that there is this nice correlation between what we have in the diet and what we have in the at the end in the fillet showing that we have quite a lot of space to increase and play with the nutritional profile of the final product. And to finalize two different uh, examples in Seabrim, uh, in this case, the diets were, the trials were run by the University of Gran Canaria in collaboration with the Spreading. Again, similar uh, growth and uh, maintain nutritional quality. And interestingly, this uh, paper clearly illustrates that we have a positive correlation with the increased level of omega-3 fatty acids with the survival of the animals. And interestingly, in this case, uh, the survival of the animals negatively correlated with the N6 to N3 rate. So again, we always need to keep in mind that we need really to balance the diet, especially when we are using high inclusion levels of uh, vegetable sources, vegetable oils. And just to close the, um, the talk, I wanted to include a trial that we have uh, run together with Natural Eva in Italy. This is this data have been submitted for publication, and again we uh, replaced the fish oil in the diets by bare to get to the same amount of EPA and DHA. Consistently, we did not have any impact on the performance on the animals. We got to the same survival index. Again, we reflected the fatty acid profile of the diets in the fillet. And what was interesting in this trial was that we analyzed the oxidative status of the flesh. We analyzed the, the TVAS, the MDA, MDA, and you can see in the, in the graph that we were able to significantly decrease the MDA um, levels in the fillet when we were replacing the fish oil by the vermizer. So this suggests that we can increase uh, the shelf life of the final product. And for this trial too, uh, we decided to use an export panel in Italy to make sure that the replacement of fish oil had no an impact in the final quality of the product. So you can see here that for the different treatments, all the parameters are scored equally. This means that the, the fillets were undistinguishable um, related to the different diets that they have been grown on. And interestingly, in this experiment, we also confirmed that there was a clear reduction in the amount of dioxins and PCBs in the fillets of animals that were fed on vermize. So that was really important because we can increase the food safety of the final consumer at the end. And obviously uh, using vermice in the diets means that we have uh, less environmental impact. So our FFDR in the diet is uh, significantly reduced. So to wrap up, um, vermice oil is an ingredient that is already tested and used in the salmonid industry. We have a uh, complete uh, documentation for marine fish and a shrimp. So we are ready to go for uh, the next step for these new species. In terms of production benefits, I would like to, to that you keep in mind this optimum omega nutrition. So we need to adjust our diets in terms of EPA, DHA, and arachidonic acid depending on our farming condition, depending on the, um, the life stage of the animals that we, we are working with. And we are sure that when we are increasing the amount of EPA and the HA in the diet, from a production per perspective, we have better survival, better health, and better animal welfare. From a sustainable perspective, obviously, we are decreasing, as I just mentioned, the marine footprint of the diet. So we are supporting the sustainable growth of the aquaculture. And thinking uh, about the consumer, I was uh, talking about at the beginning of my talk, we know that we can provide to this final consumer products that are 
better in terms of nutritional quality, that are safer in terms of diacin on PCBs, and we know that the consumer will appreciate that because at the end, what he wants is a product that is good for him, but also good for the for the planet. And that's the end of my presentation. Yes, good for the planet, good for the consumers, good for the industry as well, right? So. Thank you for those remarks. Um, Pete, Esther, that was uh, great, very full of insights. I do want to try to get to at least one or two questions before we close our session today. Um, so for any, our audience who's interested here, um, where do you get started with your looking at fish meal reduction, uh, fish oil reduction in the diets? Uh, what's your advice? Well, I think for, it's, I would say there are five major steps I think the first step is to define um, what's your objective when you reduce. You still have, want to have your objective of cost and performance target there. Is it a simple cost reduction or you want still uh, to have equal performance or even better performance and better quality? So that's the first thing. You have to know what you're looking for. And then second thing, when you have uh, defined this objective is to say, okay, what are my requirements to reach that objective, nutritional and functional? Okay, which uh, nutrients I have to get at which level for this species, this culture stage, this environmental conditions, this fish quality, and what functionalities do I have to add for health, for different things to reach my objective. Once you have done that, and that's the, the difficult part, I think then you have to see, okay, with my reduction of fish meal, fish oil, which of these vital nutrients or functionalities am I taking out and trying to put them back with the alternatives like we discussed. And then, of course, uh, it's not enough to put it back. I, I, I tried to point that out in my presentation is people forget that the alternatives might have some potential negative effects or, neg or some risks that you have to manage. So you have to manage the risk of what you're using as an alternative. A typical one is for the plant proteins, mycotoxins, these things. And then I think uh, the last step is, of course, then to correct the fish quality if needed, if your fish meal substitution has had an impact on your fish quality, is to bring it back into the, to the nutrition. Esther, I don't know if you have something to add on this process. <laughs> I, I really agree to your point. I think that what is important here for a, a farmer is to have a clear mindset of what's the final aim. Is he willing to reduce the cost of the production? Is he willing to increase the health of the animals? Does he want to market a premium product in the market or Correct. have a lower em environmental uh, footprint? And depending on each of those situations, you can frame and adapt your diets or your alternative in a different way. I think that maybe you are interested in being sustainable and being paid more for your product or uh, supporting human health, as I was mentioning before. So I think that, yeah, the first thing is to clear up your mind and make sure what is your final target. And then the decisions are done in a very easy way. Yeah, correct. Right. That's great advice, yeah. And, and clearly you're gonna have different approaches depending on which objective you choose. So thank you for that uh, piece of advice. Uh, we have another question here about, how can plant and algae-based diets be combined in order to reduce dependence of fish feeds on fish meal and fish oil, and therefore improve the sustainability? Uh, Esther, can we start with you? Sure. So basically, I tried to address that point when I was illustrating the evolution of the aqua diet. So we know that these traditional ingredients were really matching the fish nutritional requirements. Now we are in a different situation because of the pricing, because of the El Nino, because of many different points. We are in this mixed situation combining the vegetable protein sources, the vegetable oils, and then we still keep a little amount of fish oil, fish meal. But we know that this will, this is dynamic. We were talking about insects, we were talking about upgraded proteins, single cell proteins, there are quite a lot of things and all of them will have a different uh, amino acid profile in terms of, of requirements, they will be deprived in omega-3 and omega-6. So I think that again, we need to, as Pete was mentioning just in the previous question, 
you need to understand what are the requirements of your animals and then you complete the puzzle. You are using a different protein source that will maybe have a slightly different amino acid profile. We know that we are not providing uh, EPA and DHA because we are um, eliminating the fish oil from the equation. So then we need to include these alternative uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And then it's kind of uh, a puzzle. I see it like that. So you are combining the different ingredients, but at the end, your aim is to cover the nutritional requirements because from a production perspective, you absolutely need to keep your performance right, your survival right, and to keep the nutritional quality of the fish that you are aiming to, to bring to the market. And Pete, maybe you can complement that? Oh, it was already very complete, but I think that uh, complementing, let's say, the um, vegetable meals and the algal meals, they are very, very nicely complementary because when we were using the vegetable meals and the vegetable oils, we were missing these key components, the, the HUFAs. And uh, now we have these alternatives to do that and we, we solve a big part of the puzzle. And plus, we still want the fish and the seafood to be healthy, to be fish. So uh, I think this, this contributes a lot and it's a, a, a nice match with the vegetable proteins that we use for fish meals reduction or fish oil reduction. Great. Um, let's stay on that topic of fish health. Um, Esther, we have a specific question about the Veramaris algal oil. Um, do you have any results uh, in terms of challenge trials against opportunistic bacterial pathogens? Very nice question. Uh, it depends on the species. I can refer again to the F3 challenge. There is a very nice paper published last year um, on a shrimp. So you can see that using this alternative uh, might improve the immunity, immunological status of the animals. Uh, we are creating some new data in salmonids too, but for example, I can refer some, to some data already uh, available showing that this increase in EPA and DHA can absolutely improve the disease resistance uh, to different pathogens. That's a clear, a clear statement already available. All right, yeah, thank I you for that. Question. Let's uh, take just one last question. We have run a bit over uh, our, our scheduled time, but you know, it, it is a good discussion and want to get to this. Uh, do you have any experience with other feed additives that you might use uh, in combination with the Veramaris uh, solution? that improve production results? And, and if so, could you broadly characterize those as, as to we stay with you to start? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, I'm coming back to what Pete was mentioning or my comments before. So we want this full uh, puzzle to be completed. So when we are using uh, these high levels of EPA and DHA, for example, we need to make sure that we are covering the, the requirements in terms of vitamins. For example, we all know that there are some fat-soluble vitamins that are coming from the fish oil, so we need to make sure if we are no longer including the fish oil in the diets that we will cover those requirements in a different way. Again, for, uh, for example, we know that uh, EPA and DHA are also important for the pigmentation processes. That's very important in the salmonid market, for example. So we know that we need to make sure that we are increasing our EPA and DHA to make sure that we have a good astaxanthin deposition at the end uh, of our cycle. So the, those could be the most clear examples. And again, I would like to come back to, to one of the points I'd mentioned. We also need to make sure that we are formulating the diet in a balanced way. And I think that we are sometimes forgetting that the N6 to N3 ratio is really key for not only the performance, but also for the, um, for the immunological status of the animal. So that's something that we, really need to keep an eye on when we are formulating our diets. Mm -hmm. Pete, anything to add on that front? Yeah, I, I think it's it's uh, like we've been trying to stress, I think, to, to, to bring the additives into a complete solution. You need to balance all the, the nutrients and the functionalities. And uh, people often try to use uh, one single additive as a silver bullet to solve some problems. That's I, I think that's not the role. I think you have to balance and then according to the functionality you are missing, 
uh, you use this type of additive or this type of uh, solution to 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 fix it. For instance, if you okay, if you if you feel that your diet main problem will be digestibility, you will look for enzymes or organic acids or essential oils. If your your diet is mainly missing the the hufa, you will go for the algal complements. Um, so personally, also I have. I have very good experience with uh, what uh, organic acids and essential oils. Why? Because even when you add these ones and you are not into a disease threat, you will still have better performance. So it pays back your 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 uh, additive, which is very important because we like to include them all the time. So um, with with uh, this type of additives, your SCR and growth is improved according to my experience, even in the absence of, of uh, disease threat. So I think you have to use the different tools in the toolbox according to your needs and make sure you use uh, the best value for the, the application. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it is part of a complete package. And I think the, the framework that we've discussed and the insights that you both have brought have really um, made that direction clear. Uh, just to add on to that, uh, from my moderator's perspective, uh, I would just like to invite everyone um, to explore that discussion, particularly around the feed additives and the gut health uh, topic a little bit further. In two weeks' time, we're going to meet again uh, right here uh, in the same place, so to speak. Uh, so in front of your uh, computer or phone uh, to, to jump into the topic of gut health, uh, stress and disease management uh, with uh, several additional experts. And we hope that you'll be able to join us. We'll send further details about that. Uh, but that is going to conclude today's discussion. And again, Esther and Pete, Really glad that you could join us. Uh, really excellent uh, insights and valuable content you've brought to us. Uh, thank you for that. And I also want to thank our audience for your participation, for your attention, and for your questions. Uh, we hope to see you again at the end of March. Thank you so much. On behalf of Biomed. Thank you, Ryan. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. you, and have a great day. Bye-bye.